Hello and welcome to Small Screen Maniac. I'm your host, Constance Miller. You'll have to forgive my appearance. I was, uh, jumped a couple of days ago, um, and I really debated if I wanted to continue to do videos until my face healed up or not, and I decided that I'm just going to. So, with all that being said, I'm going to discuss spoilers for X-Men 97, Episodes 6 and 7. Let's start with Episode 6. We begin in outer space, which means we get to see some of the Shi'ar, especially War, uh, Deathbird. And what a delight that was. She's kick-ass and super amazing, and she had the Royal Guard with her as they're fighting Ronin and the Kree. And they get summoned away by Empress Lilandra, uh, who announces that uh, she and Professor Charles Xavier are getting married. Big news. Some of the Shi'ar aren't too keen on this idea, as Charles Xavier is a Terran, a mutant Terran at that. And Deathbird herself uh, invokes a challenge that would wipe away Charles's memories of Earth and his X-Men, and it must be performed by Lilandra. Oh, the drama. <laughs> I believe it's Lilandra, not Lilandra. I don't know why I keep saying Lilandra. Before the mind wipe can fully take place, Charles Xavier chooses not to renounce his X-Men and he pulls some of the Shi'ar and Deathbird and Lilandra onto the astral plane and talk about their culture and what has brought them to fruition as they are today. And he is soon interrupted by a violent image of Gambit and turning into a corpse, then a sentinel and Charles was like, I need to get to Earth. I need to be with my X-Men. The second half of episode six is Life Death Part Two. Well, the whole episode is Life Death Part Two, but Storm can't have her own episode at any rate. So Forge was bitten by the adversary and Storm has been tending to his wounds and the adversary is like all mocking in the background and stuff like that. And Storm is just like, I need out of here. And then Forge gets up and vanquishes the adversary with some magic. And I totally forgot that Forge wields magic. So that was a nice touch. So he collapses and the infection is getting worse. And he mentions to Storm that there's a magic cactus that grows in this cave uh, that should be able to heal his wounds, but he can't go alone. So, of course, you know, she says, you know, we'll ride together. And he's just like, no, I must do this. But she's like, no, listen to me. So they ride out and they get to the cavern and lo and behold, the cactus grows up in this, like, mining shaft, and obviously it's a tight space, and that obviously would trigger Storm's claustrophobia, but she insists on doing it, and so she goes, and the adversary shows up again and does this funky little scary head twist thing a couple of times, and yeah, freaky stuff. And then Storm realizes that her true potential has been hidden by herself and she unleashes the fury of 
the weather and it can be seen from space and her hair grows back. How? I don't know. Um, and she dons her classic 70s slash 80s costume and it's glorious. It And she flies around and yeah, it's like a coming of age moment for Storm and that's fantastic. So they get back to Forge's place and she uses the magical cactus to heal his wounds and he suggests them whisking out together somewhere and whatnot and she's like that wouldn't be a bad idea and then he turns on the TV and it's the news of what happened in Genosha and Storm just starts crying. So that was episode six in a nutshell and now we're going to talk about episode seven and this is a very very interesting episode. And I would like to call out that I did name the big bad of the series in my last episode, and that is Bastion. We start off with Gambit's funeral, which is being uh, performed by Nightcrawler, very fittingly, and Rogue is absent. And however, Belladonna's there. How interesting. Um, and, um... So, since Rogue isn't there, she is off trying to find Henry Peter Gyrick and Bolivar Trask to make them pay for what happened in Genosha uh, for basically killing Gambit and Magneto. And she is on a serious rampage and she decimates a government installation where we see Thunderbolt Roths. He claims he doesn't know what's going on. Um, so she ends up going. That was unnecessary. Uh, she eventually ends up in this winter wonderland where there's this wooden shack, and boom, Steve Rogers, Captain America, shows up and he realizes that this is an underground bunker of sorts and. There's these screens that say OZT, and at first I was like, OZT, what the heck is that? And then I was like, oh, Operation Zero Tolerance. Yes, okay, that makes sense now. And therefore I knew that Bastion was gonna show up. So Rogue doesn't get the assistance of Captain America in her quest for vengeance. And uh, the X-Men uh, head to Genosha for uh, rescue relief and aid. And they uncover Emma Frost as a survivor who has used her secondary mutation of turning into a living diamond in order to save her own life. So that was interesting. That was ripped right out of the comics. And uh, they get a message from Bolivar Trask saying that they need to come to Madripoor. Um, that's where everything is going down. Um, and so therefore they decide to go and they stop in Mexico City along the way to pick up Rogue who has broken down. She is just infuriated or exhausted, I should say, um, from grieving. And she had absorbed Henry Peter Gyrick's memories in order to get to Bolivar Trask. But Bolivar has already led them to him, so... So they head to Madripoor. They get to the building that Bolivar Trask has had cleared out. And they discover that there's a new kind of sentinel being created. And Bolivar is on the roof, on the edge, getting ready to jump and saying, I, you know, it necessarily wasn't Mr. Sinister who was pulling all the strings, it's somebody else. And he goes to jump and Rogue catches him by the coat and asks him a few questions and he can't really answer. So she drops him. 
she just lets him go. And everybody is like, what the fuck? And then all of a sudden, as Rogue is on a rampage, she gets smacked down by Bolivar Trask, who is now this human hybrid sentinel. So the X-Men go toe-to-toe -to -toe with it. And each of them displaying great amounts of power, especially Jean. Yes, girl. And um, it's ultimately Cable who defeats him. Um, or defeats it. Um, and then Scott, like, and Jean both realize it's Nathan from the future. And Cable calls Scott dad and says that there's somebody much bigger behind all of this than what they realize and the X-Men need to come together to take him down. And then we cut to um, somebody sneaking into uh, Henry Peter Geirich's room and this person who is Bastion uh, smothers him to death. And then he has an exchange with Mr. Sinister and Mr. Sinister said that he was a former villain. Um, so I'm interested to see what that's all about. Because I thought Bastion was his own villain. But, and I, it's been forever since I've read those comics that if he has an origin story that I'm unaware of, maybe they'll tell it here. And then we cut to this old abandoned barber shop and Magneto is being held there with one of those mutant inhibitor collars and his mouth is duct taped shut and he's strapped down to a chair and Bastion plays uh, the Purple People Eater song and he decides to give Magneto a shave with a um oh what do they call those a straight razor and that to me is always horrifying whenever somebody does that in a movie or TV show because I instantly think of Sweeney Todd and um, I know they wouldn't do that in the cartoon, but I don't know. Some, some of the stuff, it wouldn't put it past them. Um, and that's where the episode ends. And so now we get the three-part conclusion over the next three weeks. Oh my gosh. So... Tell me what you think in the comments below. Did you realize who the big bad was before the rest of us did, like I did? And uh, sound off in the comments. Uh, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Also, if you're inclined to help the channel grow, you can do so by following the links in the description. And as always, love and light to you all.